All right, we're live. Okay, so chapter 5.2, properties of functions. This is not just about describing the properties of functions. It's also about the, the symbols and the logic and the language we use to communicate thoughts and ideas about functions. So copy stuff carefully. Try your best to write neatly. I have to be able to read your symbols when you write them on the tests. Domain. Everybody should know what domain is. Domain is all of the possible values that the input or x values of a relation can be. Sorry that my handwriting is kind of slanted. Range is all of the possible values that the output or y values of a relation can be. A function is a relation where each domain value, ooh, and we have a fancy new word for the values in a domain, the numbers, the objects. Remember we called them elements. So each element of the domain corresponds to a unique output or range value. Put another way, Every x has a unique or one possible y value. Okay, and just like in yesterday's lesson, we're going to start off by looking at things that are not too terribly mathy. We'll start with words and ideas before we move on to numbers and symbols. So the first example, here, I'll slow down a bit. Some of you write a little slower than me. It's frozen for you, Hannah? What? Okay, hold on. I might be able to fix this. Let me move over to here, the mouse. And Oh, it's better now? Okay. Might have just been a glitch then. Everybody else at home, put a, let me know in the uh, let me know in the comments if uh, if you're seeing a glitch or freeze. Sometimes it's helpful if I just take myself off of share screen and then go back on. Sometimes that just fixes whatever problems people are having. Okay, so like I said, this one's just going to be kind of words and ideas. We've seen this one already. Apples are red, cherries are red, blueberries are blue, huckleberries are blue, and apples, of course, can also be green. So what is the domain for this? Well, again, what's domain actually mean? It means all of the possible inputs, the ones that you start with. So the domain here is all the fruits. The domain is apple, blueberry, cherry, and the one that I hate trying to spell, huckleberry. There we go. And the range is the colors. So what are all the elements 
the objects or ideas that make up the color? Well, there's three of them. Blue, green, and red. Is this a function? No. There is one thing spoiling this thing. There is one element of this relation that is keeping it from being a function. You could say that there is one bad. It's the problem is apple. Oh, had to really reach for that pun there, eh? The problem is the apple. You see, the apple sometimes is green and sometimes is red. Functions don't behave that way. As it says in our little note here, every x has to have one possible y. So if these are the x's and these are the y's, if the fruit is the input, the color is the output, the system is not a function, the relation is not a function, if an element in the input can have two different outputs. It's not a function because the input Apple has two possible outputs, green and red. Functions don't play that way. Every x has to have a unique y. Is it okay if two different x's have the same y? Yes, it is. Notice I did not complain about cherries. It's okay that cherries are red and apples are red. Not a problem. Two different inputs can have the same output, but one input can't have two different outputs. Same problem. We have food and their food group. Oh, this reminds me of health class back in junior high. Oh, remember the food pyramid? I found out. I was, I was this year's old when I found out that that whole food pyramid thing that they tried to teach you in junior high is mostly nonsense. It comes more or less from, or actually, I guess maybe they probably don't teach it anymore because they probably figured out like 20 years ago that the food pyramid is all hogwash. The food pyramid kind of more than anything reflects the... Uh, the whims of, uh, of uh, the lobbyists to the U.S. government from like the farming industry saying, yeah, we have to have lots of grains in the food pyramid. You can, you can live your whole life never eating a single grain in your life and you'll live a very long, healthy life. And the same thing is true with meat. The same thing is true with dairy. At the end of the day, all you really need are the basic nutrients to get by, some starches, some carbohydrates, some fats. You don't need to eat specific things. You can get all those things from a variety of sources. We're almost like goats. To be honest, we could probably eat tin cans and paper and we'd probably live. I don't know how well we'd live, but we'd live. Anyway, good thing I'm not teaching nutrition class, eh? State the domain and range for the following relation state, whether or not the relation represents a function. Okay, so once again, domain, I know, lots of writing, stay with me. Domain is all of these foods that I have to spell. And it's a good thing they're written here because I didn't know broccoli had two C's. Broccoli, there we go. Cheese. Kiwi, I don't know what they're cooking here, but this is quite the recipe. Milk and an orange. What's my range? Well, the range is dairy, fruit, vegetable. So, is this a function? What do you think? Yes. This is a function. Notice it doesn't have anything like that diabolical apple we had in the last example. Every single input only has one line away from it because every input only has one output. Notice there are multiple inputs at the same output, right? There's there's two different fruits and two different dairy products. That's okay. Two different input can have the same output, but not the other way around. I'll even write that in words here. Every input 
has a unique output. Unique means different. All right, let's finally get to some numbers. And let's start thinking about functions like they're little machines. We could start, actually, we go back to example one and think of this like it's a machine. Let's say, for example, I would like to run my supermarket without people, because, you know, people. So I hire robots. And my robot has to, of course, collect all the food off the truck and put it into the right section of my store. So my robot comes along and goes, broccoli, beep, 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 vegetable, and it takes it over to the vegetable aisle. My robot goes, cheese, beep, 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 and it puts it in the dairy aisle. My robot is behaving properly. My robot understands that, yep, this rule is a function. Notice that if I go back to the first example, for example one, this robot needs to be fired. Because this robot wouldn't know what to do. If I had my, it would, it would have all the apples mixed up together. Because of course, this supermarket organizes its food by colors. It's in the blue aisle, it's in the green aisle. Okay, my metaphor is kind of broken down here. Let's get to numbers where I know what I'm talking about. The robot's gonna be much happier. The robot was not happy dealing with fruit. The robot likes numbers. The robot looks at the number one and goes, oh, when I see a one, out goes a three. When I see a two, out comes a four. When I see a three, out comes a five. If you give me a four, I give you a six. And the robot says, if you give me a five, I'll spit out a seven. Input, output. X and Y. Domain and range. So my domain is and I can just list them. I can say one, two, three, four, five. That's my domain. Now, set notation does demand that you have to draw those curly brackets. And as you may have noticed, I quite suck at them. Okay? Uh, somebody, somebody wants to have a, a sociological discussion here. Save that for your social studies class, Ken. Robots don't have to get paid. Yeah, well, guess what? You're right. Robots don't have to get paid, but uh, they got to be programmed, they got to be maintained, they got to be serviced, all of which are real, real good jobs, and all of which are jobs that you couldn't just hire any schmo to do. Just about anybody could stick something on a shelf. Just about anybody could work a till. So, yeah, the jobs aren't going away. They're just being replaced by higher tech jobs. There's a lesson in that. Anyway, again, save, save, save discussions like that for social studies class. Meanwhile, over here at domain, the domain for this set of ordered pairs, this relation, is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and its range, and again, I, okay, I'm going to try really hard to draw this bracket as nice as I can. Eh, you can see an example of what it's supposed to look like, you know, right here. That's, that's, what, I'm, that's what I'm going for. And my range is 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Now, this isn't good enough for me. I want, I want the symbols to be fancier. I, I, I really feel exhausted having actually written out 10 numbers like a peasant. I, I am going to write it like this. Oh, actually, I'm going to scoop that up. Whoa. This thing here says the same thing as that. Welcome to the language of math. How do you read that? Well, you read it like this. Let me, let me translate that into common everyday English. Every single stroke of my pen there has meaning. The domain is, that curly bracket tells me that I'm going to do it, the set of oh, here, let's, let's kind of one at a time. 
all x values, even this line here, this straight up and down line, actually says stuff to a mathematician. It says such that. Now, how do you read this part? Well, math, like I said, is kind of like a language. And this is one of the cool things. Everybody, of course, who is in this room, to at least some degree, can read English. And like all Western languages, it is left to right. There are probably a few people in this room who can read me languages that are right to left. Anybody got any basic Japanese? To this day, most Japanese is top to bottom. Math, we got all those beat. In math, you can read something by starting in the middle and reading in both directions. Ha-ha! This thing here actually says x is greater than or equal to 1 and, because it's got two of these symbols, less than or equal to 5. There you go. That's a lot of words. And that symbol, that, that says it. See, notice you start in the middle and you read to the left. There's people going, wait a minute, that's, that's a less than symbol, not a greater than symbol. Not if you're reading from the right and moving left. X is bigger. Remember, the symbol is like a mouth that wants to eat the bigger piece. Isn't that the way they taught it to you in elementary? Those of you at home can't see that I'm actually, my hand has become a puppet that is now eating. I always think of the less than symbol like it's Pac-Man. There we go. Uh, you were very impressed with my Pac-Man sound effect there, I bet. So there we go. This is x is greater than or equal to 1, but it's less than or equal to 5. That's what that says. And the comma doesn't really mean much. It's just a comma. You could just use a space. The comma is the one thing in here that's optional. And finally, this last part here, if you were paying attention in Lesson 1, in 5.1, what does that say? It says that the x values are, remember what this little symbol means again? Look back in your notes, it's in 5.1. It's the Greek letter epsilon and it stands for the word, no, no, you can't see it in your look back to 5.1. Nobody, anybody at home? What's that wacky epsilon mean? The word we're looking for is elements. And what does this weird looking N mean? We talked about that the other day too. An N with an extra line is There you go. So this entire thing here That entire thing, actually I don't want that circle, I'm going to get rid of that. There. If I was reading it from left to right in English, I would read, the domain is the set of all x values such that x is greater than or equal to 1 and less than or equal to 5. The x values are elements of the natural numbers. It's basically a paragraph of information in one set of symbols. Everybody using a pencil? In case you do this wrong, you have to erase. See if you can do the same thing I just did for the range. Everybody give it a try. I'll give you a minute. Mr. Teller? Question. Yes. Can we do it the way we did example two? We do it the way we did example two. Yeah. This is example two. No, I like the way we did exam oh, the second the example two. This one's example three. Oh, as in just write them happens. down? Yes. I'm afraid you will not get very far in math in the rest of high school if you cannot read and understand these symbols. They're not going anywhere. So you might as well get used to them. They're not that tough once you get used to them. I mean, everything else, is, everything here is symbols, right? Right, think about, think about this symbol right here. It means, really, really three, it means, it means this many. I'm holding up three fingers. 
That's a symbol. Everything in math is symbols. We've got to get used to the symbols. Okay, so give the next one a try. So what is the range? Again, I could write the range as just listing. And this is, I think, what you meant by your question, right? Can't we just write them down? Yep, you can. But you also should be able to understand how to do it this way. So the range is the set of, oh, ranges and x values. What values make the range? Look back in your notes. The y values, such that. What, what, how do I do this part that I have highlighted yellow? What's it going to look like for this one? It's going to be 3 is less than or equal to y, or reading it from right to left, y is greater than or equal to 3, which is less than or equal to 7, comma, y is an element of the natural numbers. There you go. Now think about what this is saying. This is saying 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Are there any natural numbers that I missed that are between 3 and 7? Could 3.5 be one of the numbers? No, 3.5 is not a natural, it's a rational. Right? Could negative 2 be one of the numbers? No, negative 2 is an integer, not a natural. So this is a very specific answer. Right? Just as specific as actually listing all the numbers. All right, so that was the A part of the question. The B part? is yes. It's a function because each x has a unique y. When I give the robot the number 1, it gives me the number 3. When I give the robot the number 2, it gives me the number 4. If I give the robot another 2, it should give me another 4 because that's the way the robot's programmed. That's the way it works. Now, actually, I just realized something. I wouldn't be wrong if instead of n for natural numbers, I had actually used z for integers. I know you probably said, but Mr. K, you said negative 2 isn't one of my answers. And you're right, it isn't, because negative 2 isn't between 3 and 7. Ah. Are there any integers between 3 and 7 that aren't on this list already? Nope. So I could have said integers. I stuck with natural numbers. All right. That is some high-level math symbol understanding. This is the kind of language of math that you're going to have to get used to as you get into further levels like pre-calculus. But of course, we don't all take math because we're going to go on to study math. I don't expect everyone in this room to become math majors, to actually study math itself and have to really deeply use the language of math. Some of you, some of you are just here for the, here for the usefulness of it. Math's just a thing you use. You don't really love it. It's just this thing that you use for your own sciencey needs. Just a tool to get science done to you. That's all math ever was to you, was a tool. <laughs> for those of you who would like to maybe think about science, we already have these words. You should remember them from science class. Independent variable, dependent variable. Basically, the independent variable is the input or x variable. And to a science person, that is the variable that the experimenter controls. And very often, the independent variable tends to be time. And it's like, what? In science, you get to control time? Well, what I mean by control is it's your control as to how you measure it, right? It's your decision experimenter that if you're going to record the, the output every 10 seconds or every 20 seconds or every four minutes, right? That's you. You set that. This is the variable set by the person doing the experiment. The dependent variable. Well, this one's kind of the way the experiment goes. It's what we call the output or responding. Maybe you've heard this before, the responding variable. Responding. I have to think about how to spell that. 
the responding variable. And of course, it's the y variable. And you would say that y depends on x. Now, there are some situations in science where it doesn't really matter which one's x and which one's y. Sometimes you don't even know. When this variable changes, does it cause the other variable change, or is it vice versa? Is the second one the one causing the change? Sometimes you don't know, but usually you know. And it doesn't have to be the hard sciences like physics and chemistry. It could be, it could be just data collection. It could be, it could be statistical sciences. One of my favorite examples to, that I would always tell kids in junior high when I had to teach this stuff is think about, for example, think about, you don't have to write this down if you don't want to, think about if I managed my, uh, a 7-Eleven and I wanted to see what the relationship was between the temperature outside and how many Slurpees we sell. Now, I would assume, I suppose I should probably, if this is 0, 0, I, I guess I should make a better chart here. I should probably make a chart like this. This is, this is Winnipeg, Canada, after all, so we probably have more negative temperatures than positive ones. So temperature, of course, has to go on the x-axis, right? I control the temperature. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm going to decide, do I talk about the temperature at the beginning of the day, or do I use the daily high? I think I'll use the daily high. So on a day where it was like 10 degrees outside, we sold this many Slurpees. On a day when it was 5 degrees, we sold a little less Slurpees. On a day when it was 30 degrees outside, whoa, did we sell a lot of Slurpees. Of course, if it got like 35, oh, there'd probably be a dip. It'd be so hot, people wouldn't even leave the house. Right? This is, I think, what basically happens. And then when it starts to get cold, well, it's going to dip. But you know what? Are you guys aware of this? You live in Winnipeg, Canada, the Slurpee capital of the world. 7-Elevens exist in the United States, in Mexico. There's some other countries, too, that have a few 7-Elevens. And compared to all of them, everywhere, on average, Winnipeg sells more Slurpees than anywhere. It is a testament to our lack of care for our personal health, because Slurpees are really, really bad for you. <laughs> That's like more sugar than you should eat in about five days in one cup. And it is a testament to the fact that we do not care how cold it is outside. If we want a frozen, frigid, sweet drink, we're just going to go buy one because we're Winnipeggers. We don't care. So you know what? I think if this was someplace normal, this would like, as soon as we get to the negative temperatures, you could probably shut the Slurpee machine off. Nobody's going to buy one. But hey, in Winnipeg, no, we're going to, we still buy Slurpees. So each one of these dots represents a day, right? Each one of them is a day. So this was the day it was 5 degrees and we sold this many Slurpees. This was the day it was 30 degrees and lots of, and it was the summer, kids were off school. Ooh, there you go. There's some bias in this. Obviously, days when kids are off school, we're going to sell more just because kids are, what do you want to do? Oh, let's go buy a Slurpee. Okay. Right? It had nothing to do with temperature. But overall, I think it's fair to say people are going to want the cold frozen drink when it's warmer outside. There's going to be a general upward trend to this data. Now, the independent variable always has to go down here, and the dependent variable always has to go here. This one has to be x. This one has to be y. Do you see that it would make no sense to go the other way? y maybe depends on x. I'll sell more Slurpees when it's warmer outside, maybe. We'll see what the data says. Notice it makes no sense to make that statement backwards. Right? The temperature outside depends on how many Slurpees I sell. That'd be cool. We could like make it warmer outside by going and buying more Slurpees, but I don't think the world works that way. And certainly data doesn't work that way, and certainly functions don't work that way. Sometimes it matters which one's the independent and which one's the dependent. And again, I always think of them as input versus output. Input, it's a 20 degree day. Output, let's see, how many Slurpees are we gonna sell? Okay, anyways, example three. Hours worked to pay. Why is this relation also a function? Because each number of hours has only one possible pay amount. My independent variable is the x hours worked. My dependent variable is y, my gross pay. Gross pay just means pay before 
deductions and taxes and stuff. And okay, now for domain, we could just open up a curly bracket and go one, two, three, four, five. But come on, let's use our fancy new language. Domain is, now hang on a sec. I just realized I used X and Y, but that's not the letters I'm supposed to use. I'm gonna erase that. This is why you should do your notes in pencil, because sometimes I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing. I'm supposed to use hours worked H and gross pay is P. And it tells me to use a capital. Okay, so my domain is all of the H values such that H is greater than or equal to one, less than or equal to five. What do you say, you wanna call those integers? You wanna call those natural? We called them natural last time. This time, let's say that H belongs to the set of, which means is an element of my integers. End of curly bracket. And again, that was a very, very big fancy way of saying one, two, three, four, five. Obviously these sets are gonna get much bigger than one, two, three, four, five, so we have to be able to understand this language. My range, range is all the capital P values, such that P, ooh, I, you know what? I don't think I can figure this out. Well, is there a way I could do, could I, could I make a list as P between some things? Well, how about instead, I don't know why I left a big gap there, let's just move that over. How about P is equal to any ideas? 12H. Now you're probably thinking, oh, do you have to say that it's an integer or whatever? Nope. Because now that I've defined P in terms of H, because H is an integer, P is an integer, right? You times any integer by 12, you're gonna get another integer. Notice that I could express this range as an equation. So I could say my equation here, if I asked you for the range and you just said P equals 12 H, that's good. Actually, if you even just said, or fine, you can just say that it's, what is it? 12, 24, 36, 48, 60. That's okay. If you wanna just list them, that's fine. But if I said, hey, what's the equation that relates my hours worked to how much they pay me? My equation is P is equal to 12 times H. Or I can say this. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, hey, that looks like P times H. It isn't. What this is saying is P or pay as a function of hours, and I just misspelled the word hours. Hours worked. Okay, math haters out there, math phobes out there, I, I, I do see your point on this one. It's like, okay, they spent years teaching me that when you see a variable and you open a bracket right away, that it's a times, that you don't need a time symbol. How come all of a sudden this isn't a multiply? Well, because it's context, right? Context here tells me that, oh, this is a function and it's the function P as a function of H. Pay as a function of hours worked. What we're gonna see most of the time is we're not gonna see P and H. That's specific to this example. Most of the time we're going to see either Y equals 12X because we use X and Y, or we'll see, and you've probably seen this before. Guys, I'm sure they must have brought this up in grade nine. Instead of Y, when you know it's a function, you can use F of X. How many people have seen something like that in their math before? The function of X, yeah, there's a few of you. It's like, okay. If you ever wondered what does that mean, all that means is I'm darn sure to, and that's not a relation, it's a function. Now, I actually did want to do maybe an example. The back page of this is blank, right? Um, I did maybe want to do an example. All the examples that were numerical here were totally, were definitely functions. I, I want to show you a couple that aren't. Or actually, I'll show you one more that is, and then one that isn't. So 
So let's say I have x and y. So let's see. How about negative 3 makes 9, negative 2 makes 4, negative 1 makes 1, 0 makes 0, 1 makes 1, 2 makes 4, 3 makes 9. What is my equation here? There it is. I heard somebody say it nice and clear. Y equals X squared. Does every X have a unique Y? Yes. So I can say that this is a function. So I could also say the function of X is X squared. Instead of Y, I could also call this F of X. The function of X. What this says is the rule for X is two times it by itself. That's what squared means, right? The function of x is to take x and times it by itself. Every x, you plug in a number, you square it. If I plugged in negative 3, I should get 9. If I plugged in negative 3 again, I should get 9 again. OK? Check out this one. Oh, I'm out of room. I'm going to have to go this way. Check out this one. Um, okay, I got to think about this. Um, one makes zero. Zero makes one. Obviously, these are not in order. Um, This. Let me think about this. Let me think about this. Oh, I should have jotted this down beforehand. I, I'm totally drawing a blank. I got I got to use scrap paper for a sec. Um, there we go. Okay. One half makes square root of 3 divided by 2. 1 half makes negative square root of 3 divided by 2. Um, square root of 3 divided by 2 makes 1 half. Square root of 3 divided by 2 makes negative 1 half. All right. Now, you know what I want to do with these things? I want to graph them. So first, I'm actually going to graph this guy. Anybody know what the graph of this looks like? There's probably somebody here. Somebody had a grade 9 teacher who showed them what the graph of y equals x squared looks like. Anybody? All right. Let's take a look. Will it be a straight line? I don't know. Let's see. I'm going to use my graphing program here. I'm going to open up. My online grapher Desmos. If you have a graphing calculator at home, say older brother or sister finished high school and left it behind for you, you can bring it to class. I'm not going to let you use it on tests. But if you ever want to learn how to work it, I will show you. Okay, so let's see. Y equals X. See, Y equals X is a straight line. Squared. Oh, look at that. There it is. Y equals X squared. Notice if I were to actually put in the points that we had. What were our points again? We went with... Uh, Negative 3 made 9. Okay, you can't actually see that point, but there it is. Ta -da. And, oh, come on. Go down. There we go. Negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. And it was, what was it again? It was 4, 1, 0, 1, 4, 9. There we go. See, all those points together make that. Right? Joined very nicely. All right, let me, let me give you, let's get a new page here. Oops, that's not a new page. Right, new blank page. Okay, so what was the uh, points that I had this time? Okay, you're, you might have to read them to me because I kind of forget them. Luckily, it'll do the calculating for me. It'll actually type in, it'll do a calculator for the square root of 3 divided by 2. But I think the first two points I, meant, I did was 0 and 1, and then I did 1 and 0, right? There we go. And then... 
Okay, which one did I do first? Was it one half first? Yeah. One half. And now here's how you do square root on this thing. You actually type in SQRT, and then it makes a square root symbol. It's really cool. Uh -huh. Look at that. Square root of 3, and then you have to kind of highlight it and go divided by 2. Oh, interesting. And then, I think I'll just copy this. Can I copy this? Oh, no, it doesn't let me copy. Okay, fine. Negative 1 half. Oh, no, that's not what I had first, right? I think I had a half again, right? Is that what I typed, what I wrote down? Was it a half again? And then negative square root 3 all divided by 2. Where do you think this is going, guys? All right. What was the next? And then I, oops, oh, okay, sorry. I've got to remember that if I move the screen, i got to click the mouse somewhere so when I move the mouse, it's a, that's not helpful. Let me try this one more time. Make it bigger. And then what? How do I make it so that the mouse is no longer moving the screen? There we go. Click it. Okay, so let's go here. And okay, then I did the, then I reversed them, right? So then it was square root 3 over 2 and negative square root 3 over 2. And then both of these make a half. Right? Is that all the data I had? What do you think is happening here? Well, there's an equation that makes this work. It's x squared plus y squared equals 1. The circle. You can represent circles with formulas. But notice the formula has both an x squared and a y squared. And because of that, this isn't a function. Because this 1 half, you plug it into the function, you can either get three ha root 3 over 2, or you can get negative root 3 over 2. Every input doesn't have unique output. This is not a function. This one, the, the other one I had, which was y equals x squared, that one is a function. Because every x you put in has a unique y. You plug in 1, you'll always get 1. You plug in 2, you'll always get 4. Back on the circle, you plug in a half, you might get the positive answer, you might get the negative answer. We can look at the algebra of how that works. You could probably guess what it is. Those of you who have done a little bit of algebra with squares and square roots, you might know why this is working this way. But even if you don't, you just have to understand that, oh yeah, clearly this is not a function. I think of functions kind of like this is the last thing I'll say about it, then we'll give you a few minutes to work. I kind of think of functions the way I think about, I got a draw for you. I think of functions the way I think about my toaster. There's my toaster. It's pretty good, eh? That's my toaster. I put in a piece of bread, and what comes out? Toast. That's a function. If this thing was not a function, you put in bread, and then out comes a bagel. And then the next time I put in a piece of bread, out comes a Pop-Tart. Then I put in a piece of bread, the next time out comes a newspaper. I don't know what kind of machine you've got there, but that's definitely not a toaster. A toaster is a machine that every input you give it, if you give it a specific input, it'll give you a specific output. That's the way I think about a function. This function that I would call a quadratic function, I don't know if you've ever heard that word before, is the x squared function. And when I put into this machine, this is the input side right here, when I put in the number 2, out comes the number 4. When I put in the number 1, out comes the number 1. When I put in negative 2, out comes a 4, but that's okay. See, if I put in another 2, out comes a 4 again. It's all good. Every input gets a unique output. 
my circle is not a function because, oh, and I forgot to, forgot to put an exit place for it. Hang on. Oops. Let's try that. Draw that again. There we go. Exit. Because in my circle, when I dumped in the number 1 half, well, I got negative root 3 over 2. And then when I dumped in a half again, I got positive root 3 over 2. That's a problem. Functions don't behave that way. Not that it's not a beautiful equation. It is. But it's not a function. All right. That's good enough for functions in one day. We've given you a lot of language, a lot to think about here. And what I want you to do now is page 262. And watch this carefully. Make sure you... Okay, now, what was the last assignment? Let's make sure I'm on the right page here. The last assignment was... Blog. Oh, this is the, oh, this is the same. Oh, I've already given you this assignment. You know what? I'm actually going to have to maybe take a look at... Uh, i got to look at the book. It's not page 262. I'm on the wrong page. Oh, I guess I could stop the uh, video now. People can always read the assignment off the blog. <laughs>